Okay. Am I on? Yeah, you are. Okay. Welcome, everybody. Uh, today we're going to talk about this long title, <laughs> A Complete Guide to Running Your Own uh, DBAS Using OpenStack Trove and VMware Integrated OpenStack. So I, I guess I'd like to find out whether any other session at the summit has a longer title than our title. <laughs> Maybe we get a prize for that. So I'm Doug Shelley. I work at Tesora, and my co-presenter is Santosh Sundaran Raman. Sorry, it's <laughs> right there from uh, VMware. He's product manager at VMware. So let's get going here. So this is what we're going to talk about. I'm going to I'm going to do kind of a quick overview of database as a service and Trove, and then kind of show you like a quick demo of how uh, how you can deploy Trove. Uh, one of the options for deploying Trove to OpenStack. And Santosh is going to uh, talk about uh, VIO and um, show a demo of uh, Trove with uh, VIO. So with that, so kind of as a you know, general overview of DBAS, so I was just start out talking about some of the challenges that people have and how they can be addressed. So I kind of frame these challenges in two ways. One of them is from the view of the developer. So what, is a, what kind of a developer see as challenges with databases? And these are some of them. Um, you know, I have a release and I need to get this out and I need my environment now. So it's all about, you know, he needs to get databases provisioned quickly and on the timeline he needs. And then from the point of view of the IT guy that's supporting him, he just doesn't understand why they need to do things so rapidly. And then if you kind of reverse this, wait, there we go. Oh. Right, from the viewpoint of the IT guy, what's, what's he see as challenges? So he's got budget issues, resource challenges, you know, why can't everybody use Oracle? That's really about, you know, IT guys really like standardization. So why does this guy need Cassandra? Can he do whatever he wants with Oracle? Um, and then you get into some of the challenges around, well, the people he's dealing with all of a sudden put their credit card into Amazon and they're off running the database on a public cloud, which, you know, probably isn't a good thing for that company. Um, you know, and there's risk issues, security, and the <laughs> kind of developer's response is, these ops guys just don't get what I'm trying to do. So in, in this context, it's kind of like you got the view of challenges from the developer, view of challenges from their uh, IT service. So what, what is the solution? So we kind of see solution as database as service. And effectively what this means is um, the delivery of a database software and everything related to it as a service. And I think we're you know, at the OpenStack Summit, so we kind of have some concept of what as a service means. But what this translates to is it's available on demand. There's no, you know, without any hardware, software installation or configuration. So this is easy, push button, single push button. And it should be fully managed and maintained by whoever the service provider is. And in the case of like enterprise private cloud, that would be your IT guys. So we've kind of, uh, I think this comes, this is like our marketing guys here. They, Pop machine, right? That's what this database service should look like. You walk up to your pop machine and you push MySQL and a MySQL database pops out the bottom of the pop machine. That's what we're looking for. So how is, how is this addressed or how can this be addressed in, in OpenStack? So one of the solutions is that it's Trove, OpenStack Trove project. So this is the Trove uh, official mission statement. So I'm gonna read it here so you can listen to me talk. To provide scalable and reliable cloud databases as a service provisioning functionality for both relational and non-relational databases, database engines, and to continue to improve fully featured and extensible open source framework. So it's a lot of words, but I think some of the key things there, one of the key things to me is really the comment about relational and non-relational. So this isn't focused just on MySQL. That's a key thing to the mission of Trove. Um, and Scalable and reliable, I think, is also very key to, well, I think to any OpenStack service, but particularly for a database service. So what is it? So what is OpenStack Trove? So one of the, I think, key misconceptions about Trove and database as a service is that all that's done is provisioning. So that is one thing that is done. So one of the first things we accomplish is you can launch a database instance. But there's much more, and I think that's important to understand. So this, besides being able to provision a single instance, you can provision and manage complex, more complex topologies, such as clustering, so provision a cluster of databases, and things like replication. So for example, launch a master and several slaves. Um, then kind of from an automation point of view, so when you get outside of provisioning, what else can you do? So you get backup and restore, you can do failover, resizing, you can scale clusters. So we got kind of horizontal and vertical scale um, there's kind of, you know, fetching log information from the instances, which is important for some use cases. 
and config management, so you can do um, database-specific tuning. Um, and again, as I mentioned in the vision uh, statement, multiple database replication supported with common APIs, that's critical to the, to the vision and the view and the implementation, relational and non-relational. And um, the management interface, the user interface is like, like everything else in OpenStack, REST API, CLI, web-based UI. Okay. So as I mentioned, this is more than provisioning. This is complete lifecycle, database lifecycle management. And I'll just quickly take you through what I, kind of a representation of how we see this. So on the top left, you got provisioning. And I think we talked about what that is, you know, demand. That's really a critical push button. Wide selection of databases. And that you, you, you know, this is single instance and clusters. Um, security, I think, is important. I think some of the features in Trove that support security, um, there's a mechanisms for basically upgrading running database instances with latest patches for operating system and um, database software. Permission, user permissions can be managed. And I think another key thing is, and this is optional, but out of the box, restrict root access. Because I think part of the point here is, is that um, you're providing an environment that the end user is using where they don't need to be root to do everything they need to do. That's part of the point. If they need to drop into root access, then I think we've kind of blown the vision. Um, tuning, I talked about some of this. So you can provide log file access to people. So for example, the slow query log on MySQL is accessible through API. Um, there's configuration management. So this is for tuning. So you could provide database specific tuning settings and you can not just point at one instance and say, do it to this one, you can provision, you can do it in such a way that it gets pushed down to multiple instances simultaneously. Um, on the management side, so there's some schema management, the replication I talked about um, for scale and availability and backup and restore. Okay. And, right, this dual view on here is confusing. Um, there's lots of databases supported, and I think, as I mentioned before in the vision, that's critical. Um, so there's your kind of um, logo slide. Um, I don't even know if 13 is actually right. It might be higher than that now. But uh, you know, all your kind of usual suspects, I think, are in there. Um, OK, next. So diving more into the architecture. So this is kind of how Trove sets up within OpenStack. And the first thing I want to show you is how kind of how Trove lays on top of standard OpenStack, and then we're going to look at what, what it kind of looks like on VIO. So you got all your, the services in the middle there, the Swift, Nova, Cinder, Keystone, Neutron, and Glance. Those are the other OpenStack services that are leveraged by Trove to accomplish its goals. Um, on the right side, you have your Trove control plane. So that's, there's basically three services, API, task manager, and conductor that do all the work. Um, the API service looks basically like every other OpenStack API service. It presents a REST API. Um, the two in the middle there, there's the circle with the crosser. That's messaging bus. So the services communicate with, say, Rabbit, like everything else. And then they use um, a database to store a metadata. And then on the right side is kind of where Trove ends up kind of being different than a lot of OpenStack services. It is the concept of a guest. So when you launch an instance, you end up with a Nova VM that ends up running a database, an image that includes, so there's your image. The image includes uh, a piece of Python code, which we refer to as the Trove guest agent, database software of whatever the database is, and then the operating system. And it kind of out of the, you know, in standard OpenStack, this would be a QCOW2 image, right? That image gets put on a Nova instance on launch, um, and then uh, is running, and the Trove guest agent is communicated with via the same rabbit, say, as the control plane. And then applications have direct access to the database. And that's key, too. Trove is not in the data plane, I call it. It's, a, it's control plane only. So the data path is still your favorite database client communicating on the port that's exposed via the provisioning. Now, what kind of, at a high level, does this look like when you go to VIO? So basically, VIO then provides VMware Integrated OpenStack provides the OpenStack services. And Santosh is definitely going to talk more about this in his part of this presentation, so I'll leave that there. But you, there's some other changes on this slide that may be hard to pick off. The guest image ends up being VMDK OVA as, as opposed to QCOW2. Um, while the Nova instance is still a Nova instance, under the covers it ends up likely being ESXi. And then the Trove control plane would also set up in a VM in, open st in VIO in, uh, as, as an ESXi VM. Okay. 
So I've talked about this a bit. I just wanted to expand on it. So multi-database is critical. I think I've said that enough that everybody gets it. Um, but key to that is that the, it's data store agnostic, right? So Trove's view is to present a data store agnostic API so that when you provision MySQL, you provision MySQL the same way that you provision Oracle or you know, Postgres or whatever else it is, right? So the end user experience through the UI and the APIs is the same. That's important to the vision. Um, if you had to do everything database specific, then what would be the point really? You'd, you might as well just use database specific tools for everything. So that's kind of on the left is the, yeah, I talked a bit about Horizon dashboard that comes with it. You'll see that in Santosh's demo. Um, the Trove controller, the control plane is those three services and then there is data store specific code in the guests, but again, that's not exposed to the people using the system, that's under the covers. So when you say Trove backup create, it ends up, the task manager ends up sending a message down to the guest to tell him to do a backup, and then he knows how to do a backup in the appropriate way for say, MySQL versus Postgres versus Cassandra. Okay, um, so I wanna show you and I haven't, this, this may be a difficult demo, I gotta try it. So I wanna show you um, how the installation and configuration of, of um, Trove goes. I'm actually gonna do it in the context of Tesora's product. So I'm gonna, because one of the things that we provide is um, simple installation and configuration. So I'm gonna, I have a video where I'm gonna run it and talk through it. We'll see how it, we'll see how it goes here. Uh, oh, did that show up? No, it's not on my screen, though. No. That's annoying. Hmm, I wonder if I can do this. Okay. Uh, let's. We went out of mirroring again. Sorry, folks. Uh... Okay, let me. Uh... I wanted to blow that up, but I can't seem to get to that screen, so. Oh, wait a minute. That's your demo, right? Yeah. I don't know why this did this. Let me just. Okay. There we go. I think Amherst out there is, I think you're gonna be making jokes about my rotten fruit laptop after this presentation, right? Okay, here we go. Okay, there we are. Okay. So we basically provide a set up shell script that will uh, install the product, but first the installation steps for our product basically. So you do some, so I'm, so I'm basically setting this up in a VM that's gonna be running Ubuntu, or is running Ubuntu. Um, and so I gotta do some things to tell Ubuntu to basically pull down um, our packages. So I'm gonna do that right here. Just a couple of steps, set up APT repos and come on. set up our key server, put our key in there, and now we're gonna, it's gonna APT get update, I think. Set, add our repo, so that's our repo for our Enterprise 1.9 product. So this, so it's a sort of D, uh, Enterprise Edition is a basically a distribution of Trove. So now it's doing the Update, oh, that fell off the bottom of the screen. Okay, so this, basically what this is, is we provide packages for the various pieces of Trove into Sora DBAS, and this is basically doing APT get install on those pieces. So it's blasting through that. I think I made this go faster in the video, so that's good. So once it finishes the package install, oh, unfortunately it fell off. The last part is it does a package install of, we also package some of the Mistral pieces because I think in Mataka, or in Newton, I can't remember, Mataka, um, we added support in Trove for um, scheduled backups and we actually used it by leveraging Mistral because there seemed kind of pointless to rewrite workflow. So this installs Mistral. From a point of view of Trove, it's actually completely buried. So Trove has the APIs to actually tell Mistral to do the right things. Um, 
So that's just doing the last bit of the install, and then we'll go on to configuration. Uh, okay. Some of these Python packages must be pretty big. <laughs> okay, here we go. Okay, so now that we're done with the package installation, and okay, here we go. We're going to run our setup script, which basically uh, asks a bunch of questions. So I guess that means it's not actually opinionated. Um, so it's going to take you through configuration. So really, uh, under the covers, what this is doing is collecting some information about your OpenStack setup and then setting up the Trove comp files appropriately. In general, that's what it's doing. Um, and as I think everybody who's installed any OpenStack services knows, figuring out what to actually put in all the comp settings in the various services is pretty challenging. <laughs> and usually you get it wrong and then stuff doesn't work. Um, this is configuring the metadata store. So you point it at a MySQL instance, whether it's dedicated to Trove or you use the one for the rest of your OpenStack as a, as a implementation choice, a deployment choice. It's registering the endpoint in Keystone. So much like every other OpenStack service, um, Trove has a, is the database endpoint. So that gets put into Keystone, uh, sets up some credentials for the thing, and then specifies the endpoint. It's just creating a user called Trove, which is effectively the service user for the, for the Trove service. And now it's going to now it's doing the Mistral config. Okay. Let's set up the end. That's Keystone setting up the endpoints, creating the services. And now it's going to. Oops, did I stop it? Yeah, okay. Collect some information about where your rabbit is, um, get some user ID and password information to connect to rabbit, and basically then set all the comp files and restart the services. So, and that trove list at the end there is like the, my key uh, debugging step. So you do all this, type trove list. If it doesn't work, you did it wrong. No, <laughs> so hopefully you get, trove list works. And in this case, there's nothing to list because we have no instances. So what I'm gonna do a quick, and the tail end of this demo is just showing you how this sets up in Horizon. So this is the VMware Horizon. So we're just gonna sign into it. Now, one of the things I did that I didn't show in the demo is I loaded a data store, which I'm going to show you. I loaded MySQL 5.6 image. Um, the tooling we have doesn't, at this moment, exactly, it doesn't create the VMDK, so that would have been done manually and put in glance, so I didn't demo that. But basically, you can see here's, here's the MySQL 5.6 uh, uh, data store and data store version in Trove, and when you do a launch, you can see uh, MySQL there. So, with that, I'll turn over to Santosh. He's going to f actually carry on and show you the rest of this demo. Um, I'll just close mine down so that you don't trip over it. And, and so I think it's, you should be good to just flip to here when you're ready, and, yeah. and you can full screen it by double clicking on there. But okay. so Let's go to those slides now. There you go, and you should be able to see it down there. Oh, go to the, yeah, there you go. Okay. So, so before I jump into a little bit of uh, Vio overview and say how, uh, talk about how Vio and Trove, uh, Tesora's Trove together provide a really stable database as a service, I want to sort of do a quick OpenStack 101 and set the context for what I'm going to talk about. So OpenStack, as all of us know, is, uh, it provides a bunch of tools for developers to consume inf infrastructure in a programmatic way, right? So it provides APIs, CLIs, heat, the orchestration layer, and a bunch of SDKs. So the developers, they can now automate their entire application, and they don't have to wait for IT to go provision their infrastructure. The moment they have their code ready, they can automate the entire next steps to go deploy that code and uh, put that into production. So the developers have what they want. Uh, to run their, uh, to develop their application, test it out, and run it in production. But what about this guy, the operator? 
as much as OpenStack is a tool for developers, the operators who are equally as important, who has to maintain that OpenStack cloud, make sure that the developers get what they want 24-7, there's a lot of things that the operator has to do, things like deploy OpenStack in a production-grade manner, keep monitoring it, something, if something goes wrong, find out first it went wrong, and then troubleshoot to figure out what went wrong and fix that. Then do maintenance on a regular basis. Say, for example, maybe they have to add more storage, or maybe they have to uh, take out a storage disk to fix that, do regular maintenance on it, patch OpenStack. Whenever there is a bug fix, whenever there is a maintenance release, maintenance release patch it, and upgrade OpenStack from one release to another. So there is a lot of complex activities that the operator has to perform, and it's really important to make sure that the operator has the right tool that makes the operator's life easy to keep operating and maintaining OpenStack uh, on an ongoing basis so that the developers get the level of service that they want. And this becomes e uh, even more important when we are starting to add up more value-added value services on top of OpenStack, specifically like database as a service, file system as a service. The more projects we keep adding on OpenStack, we, the more the operators should have the right tools to maintain OpenStack and the more important it is to make sure that OpenStack itself is built on a stable platform. Because the stability of OpenStack as a whole, OpenStack is only as stable as the platform that you build it on top of. And that's where VIO, the product, comes into picture. So our goal with VIO is to sort of attack the problem that I mentioned earlier. One is, how do we make sure that as we keep piling services on top of one on top of the other, it's easier for the operator to maintain the OpenStack. It's easier for the operator to do things like deploy, patch, upgrade, uh, day-to operations, all of that. So one of our key focus is to simplify all of those operations through uh, providing simple, canned workflows to do all of those operations for deployment, upgrade, any operation that has to do with OpenStack. So that's one of our goals, and we did a really good job of integrating a lot of the OpenStack workflows into vSphere so that typical IT admins, IT admins are, who are used to running vSphere in their uh, data centers, they can now go use the same interface to now operate OpenStack in a well-known manner. So that takes care of the simplicity aspect of things. And the other aspect of providing, uh, making the operator's life easy is by is providing a stable platform on which they can run OpenStack. And there what we do is we provide integrations with uh, vSphere, NSX, vSAN, or any vSphere data stores. And we try to expose as many of the enterprise production-grade features in these platform through OpenStack so that the operator now has a platform that they know how to operate. And now the developers get a solid, uh, resilient, OpenStack distribution that's built on battle-tested infrastructure. So that's our strategy with VIO, which is provide a simple OpenStack distribution that's super simple to operate and that runs on a stable platform so that the operator is not going and troubleshooting the infrastructure uh, continuously to keep the infra infrastructure up and running. So, so that's our strategy with the VIO product, VMware Integrated OpenStack. And what exactly is VMware Integrated OpenStack? It is a distri standard distribution of OpenStack, meaning the OpenStack code that ships with VIO is the standard upstream code that you would see with any other distribution or that you would see if you get OpenStack from upstream, directly from GitHub. We are DevCore certified, meaning uh, our OpenStack distribution the APIs that, we are exp that, that are exposed through VIO are the sa exact same OpenStack APIs that you would see with any other OpenStack distribution. In fact, we were the first distribution to get uh, DevCode certified. And along with that, as a, the distribution also includes the right tools, management tools to operate OpenStack, do things that I mentioned earlier uh, that an operator would typically have to do, like upgrade, uh, deploy, upgrade, maintain patch, things like that. So in a nutshell, that's... VMware integrated OpenStack. So going, sort of going back to our approach where one of the uh, main pillars of our approach was providing an OpenStack that's simple to operate, and the other was to provide a stable platform on which to run. So on the, the first thing, providing a simple uh, OpenStack that is simple to operate, the way we do it is first, we provide a lot of workflows that integrate, that make it possible for 
typical IT admins, typical admins who are used to vSphere in their environment to use the same tools, but to start operating OpenStack now. So there are workflows to deploy OpenStack using a very simple 10, 12 step GUI driven process, no CLI, no uh, 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 meddling with the config files, uh, no uh, deploying, uh, downloading packages or any of that, any of that thing. The entire process is streamlined through a very simple GUI driven workflows. Likewise, workflows for operating OpenStack, uh, patching and upgrading OpenStack. So that is a key component of VIO that makes it simple to operate OpenStack. And the second is we've added a lot of uh, nifty tools to our distribution of OpenStack, uh, simple CLI tools that will allow the admin to get a quick snapshot or a quick summary of the OpenStack deployment to figure out what is the health of my OpenStack cluster? Is everything up and running? Are there any services that are down that I need to go take care of as an operator? Uh, things like tools that enable operator to do performance troubleshootings. If, if a developer comes to me and complains, hey, my Nova VM boot is taking twice as long as it used to in the last week, we have tools to help the administrator go look at the entire trace for what happens when any OpenStack operation is triggered and figure out uh, where the bottlenecks are and then go start troubleshooting what's going on. We have, integra we have integrated the entire OpenStack log to a syslog server and if the syslog server that's being used is log inside, which is our own uh, uh, syslog server, we've also built custom dashboards that will help the admins pinpoint what exactly is going on in their OpenStack distribution. Say if there is a error in NOAA or something, they'll immediately see that in their login set dashboard and that is going to allow them to start troubleshooting and maintaining their OpenStack distribution in a much more easier way. And the last bit is, we've also built a custom management pack for vRealize operations, uh, along uh, the short form is uh, vrops. vrops is basically a monitoring tool that we have which allows admins to monitor their infrastructure. So we've built a custom management pack for OpenStack, which is going to allow the admin to get a deeper view into the health of their OpenStack cluster. Say for example, are all the data stores that are allocated to OpenStack, are they healthy? Are they running full? Do they need to update or change something there? Uh, if, if a tenant deploys a VM, the ad administrator wants to find out which hypervisor the VM got deployed to, which data store on that hypervisor the VM got placed on. So the management packs, uh, the management pack that we built for OpenStack provides integrations uh, uh, that helps operator keep tab on what exactly is going on in the OpenStack deployment. So by providing all of these integrations and all of these workflows and tools, we made it really, really simple for an operator to provide OpenStack for their developers so that they don't have to worry about babysitting OpenStack on an infrastructure that's not stable or going and changing something that is not uh, very familiar to them. So we've made OpenStack consumable for the average IT. And the other piece where we're providing a stable platform, I wanted to point out a bunch of capabilities that specifically apply to database as a service. So one of the key things is the ability to leverage tiered storage. By that, what I mean is, as we saw in Trove, there are multiple database, databases being supported. As an operator, I may want to place some of my uh, database type, say for example, I want to place my Oracle database on traditional SAN data stores. I want to place some of the newer NoSQL kind of databases like Redis or Cassandra on my uh, commodity uh, uh, storage backend, say like uh, uh, a hyperconverged storage where I put them on uh, disks in the hypervisor. I can easily do that with uh, when I'm running OpenStack on vSphere by leveraging the storage-based policy feature of vSphere where I can define policies that uh, direct different types of workloads to different kinds of data stores. And I can say, hey, uh, my Oracle VM has to go to gold data store, which is a traditional SAN. My Cassandra data store database can go to uh, commodity uh, storage. So having that capability m makes it easy for the storage, uh, for the o OpenStack operator to define how, which database needs to be placed on which uh, storage backend. Likewise, uh, when running databases uh, uh, in production, it may be uh, very important to make sure that the database 
instance is not starved due to some noisy neighbors. The administrator, the operator may want to define some policies around reservation where they want to reserve dedicated capacity for the database instance. Say, for example, I want to reserve a certain set of IOPS for my database so that whenever there is a lot of IO going on, my database is not starving due to a lack of IOPS. Or likewise for a network, if the uh, uh, database is writing to uh, uh, a backend storage that's connected through the network, I want to make sure that I reserve certain bandwidth for that database so that it not, does not starve when there is a lot of I.O. going on. So all of that can be easily done through uh, a well-known feature in uh, vSphere that enables the admin to reserve dedicated capacity for virtual machines or for workloads so that there is no starvation when there is uh, multiple workloads competing for resources. And also things like uh, uh, Doug mentioned that Trove also enables uh, developers to deploy OpenStack cl or database clusters. And one of the things that developers would want to do when they deploy a database clusters is make sure that multiple nodes that build up that cluster are not going to sit on the same hypervisor. That sort of defeats the purpose, right? So there, what uh, vSphere, vSphere already has the capability of uh, providing affinity and anti-affinity rules between instances so that when a developer defines their database cluster, they can do so in a manner by defining policies that will place the database instances on multiple hosts so that when say one of the hosts goes down, uh, it does not take the entire database cluster down with it. So these are some of the capabilities that sort of apply very specifically for the database uh, application, the databases that can be deployed using the database as a service. But there are also tons of other features that vSphere and NSX as a platform provide for running a, real, a really stable OpenStack cloud. Things like uh, enabling HA at the hypervisor level, enabling vMotion or DRS where the OpenStack developer does not have to, or the, the operator does not have to worry about what if one of my hosts goes down? What, what happens to my workload that I deployed if one of my hosts goes down? Or uh, how do I move my workloads from, uh, say, if the operator wants to evacuate a host and take it down for maintenance, uh, how does the operator do that? So all of those features are provided at the vSphere layer, and the admin can do all the maintenance, like, say, for example, evacuating a host or migrating virtual machines at the vSphere layer without impacting anything on the OpenStack layer. So by running vSphere, uh, OpenStack on vSphere, the operators can provide a stable, uh, stable OpenStack platform for their developers. So that sort of, uh, I quickly wanted to uh, highlight how VIO solves some of the issues around uh, some of the complexities around op operating OpenStack and sort of put that in perspective with database as a service because database as a service is an additional service that is going to be run on core OpenStack. And, as we start adding more services, it's important to make sure that the underlying platform is stable and easy to operate, and that's exactly what uh, VIO provides. With that, I'll quickly jump into a demo when I get to switch this. How do you do that? Nope. Thanks, Doug. So Doug showed us an example of how to deploy Trove using the tester of the packages. So once we deploy Trove, how does a developer actually consume Trove, uh, consume database as a service to start writing their application? So I have a really quick example to show how a developer will use database as a service to build a web application. So this is our standard Horizon dashboard. I've already deployed a web application in one of my instances, which is, uh, I just called it web app. And the Trove or database as a service can be accessed through the database uh, tab in Horizon Dashboard. So here, what I have is I have two ta tabs. One, the lower tab is my web application. And there, right now, I'm trying to connect to a database, and it's going to fail because I don't have any database provisioned. 
Next, what I'm going to do is I have a tiny shell script that is going to go call the Trove CLI to create a database for me. So here, as we can see, I'm going to do a Trove create of a MySQL database. Uh, and inside that MySQL instance, I'm going to create a database uh, called Django. And I give it a user and, uh, username and password for the MySQL instance that is going to run inside that database. And I tell Trove which network to connect that to so that I place it on the same network as my web application for the simple example. Once I do that and once I give a password for the MySQL instance, Trove is going to go deploy an instance and deploy a MySQL instance and configure it based on the input values that I just gave. So, and once I do a Trove list that Doug used to check his uh, Trove deployment, now we see that the Trove database, MySQL database instance that I created shows up. And the key thing to note here is the Trove instance is actually a Nova virtual machine. So if you go to a Nova list, it's going to show up my Trove database instance as a running virtual machine because the database instance is actually running inside a Nova instance. So that's what we see here. We see that we, uh, once this pauses, yeah. We see that I have the web app that I already created prior to starting the database instance, and I also see my database instance VM here. If I go to my OpenStack dashboard, I can go see that uh, Trove is trying to spin up the virtual machine and bring it up with the OpenStack, uh, with the MySQL packages on it. And I can see the same on my Nova VMs as well. So with that, we can either wait, or since this is a recorded demo, I can fast forward. I hope I can do that in real life too. Okay. So now our Trove database instance has been created. It's up and running. And we can go back to see how I can actually use this database instance in my web application that I just uh, deployed before this demo. So this is my web app instance. So I've already lo logged into my web application. And here, I'm trying to connect to, whoops. Uh, I just connected to the MySQL database that was created a uh, little while back. Now, because the database was created, I'm able to connect to my database instance. And I see my MySQL prompt, which we will typically see when we access a MySQL database. Here, I do a show database to show the database that databases that have been created, the database schemas. And I want to use the Django database to create my backend for my web application. This is a new database, so there is no tables or anything there. So what I'm going to do is I have a script that is going to go create all the tables that I need for my web application. I'll just run that script I have. And it's going to create a bunch of tables on the uh, MySQL instance that was just deployed using Trove. I'm done with that. Now I log back into my database uh, instance just to make sure that the tables I created are actually there. So I can go into my database and show all the tables, and I should be able to see all the tables that, in my, that my web application needs to store its data. Now that my database backend has been configured, let I'm starting my web server on my web app, which is going to use that database backend to store the data that uh, it's going to send back to the database. So here, I, I, we see that the web app has a floating IP, which is the IP that I'll need to access my web applications from outside of the private network. So let's just copy that and access that web application. It's a very simple web application that is going to take whatever string I give it and store it inside the database. So this is the web app, and any string I enter here, it's going to take that string and put it back in the database. So in essence, like as Doug mentioned, what I've got uh, from databases and services by a single click, or in this case, by a single CLI, I have a running instance of a database with all the packages necessary, configured the right way. And as a developer, I don't have to worry about going and setting up MySQL, or if it's another database, going and setting up a database, pulling the packages. 
I do one click or I call one CLI and I have the database ready and I can focus on my web application or any application that I develop that needs database. And in Vio, what we've done is we made it very easy to deploy and operate OpenStack itself. So the operator does not have to go learn anything new or if there is a new service called like Trove or there is a different service for uh, later on, the operator does not have to worry about going and uh, learning new tools or uh, learning new skills to, to provide those services to the developers. With VIO, they can use their existing tools, existing workflows that they are familiar with to just provide newer services to their developers. And with Tro, Tessera Stro, which provides, which does the same thing for Tro, what Vio does for OpenStack, Tessera does that with Tro. And together, it is possible to provide a production grade development platform for developers uh, that, that provides developers compute as a service, network as a service, and now database as a service too. So that, that's pretty much all I had. Anybody any have any questions? questions? I have a question. Uh, sorry, it's a little bit unrelated, but uh, it's related to Trove. As a, as a release of the uh, Ironic, as part of the Mitaka and the Neutron, is Trove able to run on or leverage Ironic? So we've done some testing of this. Um, Basically, the, I, I, there's a, a driver in Nova for Ironic, and Trove is hitting the public API for Nova. So assuming you configure Ironic properly, it should, as it would, just work. It's just, <laughs> um, I, at Tesora, I know, I think Amrith, is he here? Oh, he was here. He left. Uh, he had done some testing for us on this. We, um, to prove that would work, um, I, I have no reason to believe it doesn't. I mean, that's... Right, so that was funny, and I think it was, I don't know if you were in, I think it was in Austin, there was a discussion about that in one of the design summit sessions. There seemed, I think there's challenges because, and I'm, I'm trying to remember, the drivers or driver, like the Nova Docker driver, I think has been deprecated, right, or something like that, is that true? I, I, and I don't know that it's supported like Cinder volume, so there could be challenges with that, whereas I believe with Ironic, we believe it's fully functional, but it's a good question. I, I, it, it's really going to depend on the driver support for containers and Nova, because at this point, Trove only knows how to talk to the Nova API. Right. You mentioned that uh, with uh, via realized login sites, there's some integration mm -hmm. there and some benefit from that standpoint. Is there any benefit uh, in via realized automation that uh, database as a service somehow ties into? For database as a service, not at the moment, but there are other capabilities that we realize automation has that can be leveraged on top of OpenStack, and that yeah, is something that, that I know. Leverage. I yeah. know that via realize can be used on top of OpenStack. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It could be your VIO, it could be yes, a, somebody yes, else's yes. OpenStack, but I was talking specifically <laughs> about database as a service. For database as a service, specifically not at the moment. Okay, so from a VRA standpoint, you're still launching an image yes, and deploying yeah. it. It can still be leveraged because end of the day, it's still a, it's just a Nova instance, and uh, when VRA talks to uh, right. automation would, talks to OpenStack, it would be stack. no different than a database instance versus a web server. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I mean, I think on you know we've just started down the path with our VIO friend, VMware yes. friends, so I think there's still opportunity for us to co collaborate on what makes sense in terms of the offering going forward. Anybody else? Okay, well, thank you, thank everybody, you. Thank for you so attending. Much. Yep. <clears throat>